LAist Studios. So we're at Del Valle Park in Lakewood. It's uh, a park that many people call airplane park because there is an airplane in it. Then there's even a kind of an aircraft control tower as part of the park. This is DJ Waldy. He's the former deputy city manager of Lakewood, a city located about 25 miles south of downtown Los Angeles. DJ is also the author of Holy Land, a poetic memoir of growing up in Lakewood. But the real centerpiece of the park is a decommissioned Douglas jet fighter from the Korean War period that uh, was donated to the city in the early 1960s and became shortly afterwards a memorial to the men from Lakewood who died in the Korean War and ultimately became a memorial to veterans uh, of every uh, conflict. And the monument that's associated with the aircraft is designed to look like the tower of an aircraft carrier. And around us are our names of veterans who their families wanted to remember. And so there's hundreds of bricks with the names of various servicemen and women who were either veterans or who died in war. One of the plaques has a poem written on it, written by a guy who grew up in the days when they still let kids play on the fighter jet and climb all over it. I asked DJ about it. He said it was written by a Vietnam veteran named Dennis Lander. And it's a poem about um, playing on the aircraft when it first arrived here. It was kind of like a jungle gym or a play, a play structure. But uh, aircraft aren't really good at that, and the plane was uh, soon moved to a pylon so that kids wouldn't get hurt climbing on it. The poem starts like this, quote, We climbed aboard that huge winged rocket and rode it to the sky. Our minds would soar for hours and hours. We're never going to die. With pitch and yaw, dives and rolls, we'd blast bad guys to heaven. We'd crash and burn and walk away. Am I nuts? Or can you imagine a young Jack Parsons reciting something similar, stamping his tiny feet? Now, a war-used fighter jet is not the first thing most people think of when they picture playground equipment. But here, it makes sense. Lakewood is one of the instant towns that popped up around Los Angeles during the 1940s and 50s. Companies like Douglas Aircraft were booming, and their employees needed somewhere to live. Basically, Lakewood went from farm fields to a bustling town in a matter of months. Arguably, aerospace is the only reason Lakewood exists. And it's not the only town like that. L.A. used to be the aviation capital of the world. Amelia Earhart learned how to fly in Southgate. Marilyn Monroe got her start as an actress after being discovered working at a World War II aircraft factory. In today's episode, we're going to find out why the aerospace industry came here. What is it about Southern California that inspires people to reach for the stars, whether it's the Suicide Squad or today's big dreamers? And we'll also address the darker side of things, how aerospace inspired people and continues to inspire people to build things that blow people up. Because here's how that Lakewood poem ends, quote, Tell them the truth about us. Don't shirk, don't squirm, don't lie and tell them that the toys boys play with could someday make men die. I'm M.G. Lord, and this is L.A. Made, Blood, Sweat, and Rockets. I'm M.G. Lord. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. The rocket scientists at JPL could tell you that even when there's a user manual, things don't always go according to plan. But life doesn't come with a user manual. Before I worked with a therapist, I used to think, why do I need one? I can talk out my problem with my friends. But I'm glad I changed course, because in therapy I discovered my problem was my friend's. Sometimes life can be a lot, but therapy can help. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. 
Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com Rockets. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Rockets. Aerospace really turned Southern California from what was really kind of a dusty agricultural backwater in 1900 into this high-tech metropolis that we know today. This is Peter Westwick. We've talked to him previously. He's the author of Into the Black, JPL and the American Space Program, 1976 to 2004. I wanted to talk to Peter to understand what it took for aerospace to grow roots here. Why Southern California? One of the starting points is this International Aviation Meet was held in L.A. in 1910. That was the first international air meet held in the United States. Um, And a bunch of city boosters in L.A. saw aeronautics as kind of the future of the area. A lot of aviators showed up, liked what they saw in Southern California, and stuck around. Now, according to Peter, some reasons for sticking around were obvious. First of all, weather. Blue skies, year-round. You can fly pretty much whenever you like. On top of that, Southern California had research universities like Caltech and UCLA. Also, lots of open shop labor. In those days, Los Angeles was notorious as an anti-union town. Then you've got a ton of venture capital lying around from the oil industry. You've got people willing to do military work. There were federal subsidies. There was city interest in providing infrastructure. First it was airplanes. Then it was the space race. L.A. was just really, really attractive to aerospace types. But there was another kind of geographical advantage, and that is a lot of open space and cheap land. It's hard to think about nowadays with real estate prices being what they are in L.A., but go back 100 years ago, and there was actually a lot of empty space, a lot of bean fields, barley fields, scattered across what is now the L.A. basin. Back then, airplanes were very dirty and noisy, and they were also very prone to fall out of the sky without warning. It was a very dangerous enterprise, and you didn't want airplanes falling down on neighborhoods. So you had all this open space to basically build airfields and fly airplanes to your heart's content. By the late 1920s, there's like 50 airfields within 30 miles of downtown LA. There's airfields all over the landscape. Here's a weird fact. A lot of the municipal golf courses in Los Angeles are built on the remains of airports. Back when aerospace was first booming, people thought commuting to work by airplane was going to be a thing. In my opinion, it still sounds more likely than Elon Musk's Hyperloop. Anyway, we've talked a lot in this podcast about the Suicide Squad's experiments in the years leading up to World War II. Well, according to Peter, the same way military money accelerated their research, it also spurred the industry across greater Los Angeles, in part because tons of people were looking for work during the Great Depression. There were individual factories that had 100,000 workers working three shifts around the clock. So each shift change was 30,000 people washing out and another 30,000 people washing into the plant at one time. These plants are like giant, basically cities, with their own transportation systems and healthcare systems and barber shops and post offices and grocery stores and shoe stores and all the rest of it. And the scale of the production was just mind boggling. This is the arsenal of democracy that enabled the United States and its allies to win World War II. Here's a stat we found doing research. Listen to this. In 1939, L.A. County had 13,000 people working in the aircraft industry. By 1942, just three years later, that number had jumped to 113,000. 100,000 more people. To meet the demand for workers, aerospace companies hired Boy Scouts to distribute job applications door to door. Here's Peter again. Industry follows the airfields. A factory will go up next to an airfield, and then the real estate developers say like, oh, hey, there's all these workers who need houses. We will build a housing development next to this factory that is next to the airfield. Right, because all those folks needed someplace to sleep at night. 
not to mention places to shop, places to school their kids, and go to church. So you have these, basically this kind of satellite cities springing up around the L.A. basin. This suburban sprawl that later came to characterize L.A. was in part driven by the aircraft industry. And thus, a charming little town called Lakewood. Lakewood was truly the first of its kind on the West Coast, one of the very first massive tract house developments in the United States, never mind in California. DJ, whom we met at the top of the episode, was born in Lakewood in 1948. He and I met through our mutual interest in aerospace. He shows me around the town where he grew up in the mid-20th century, And in a way, it almost looks like nothing's changed. It's quiet, quaint. Its streets are lined with enormous shady trees that feel right out of Leave It to Beaver. When DJ's parents moved to town in the 1940s, the trees were only saplings, newly planted. Many of the nearly identical homes, practically designed in a lab to house the stereotypical American nuclear family, were still being built and the big aerospace manufacturer nearby was Douglas Aircraft. They employed tens of thousands of people at the height of the war in 24-hour shifts. Toward the very end of the war, the vast majority of the workers at the plant were women, men having been drafted out to fight the last months of the war. It obviously was a powerful economic engine, and Douglas Aircraft Company was the principal employer, but not the only one. There were other aircraft manufacturing plants in the region, North American Rockwell, Convair, and others. Lakewood begins in late 1949 when three developers, Ben Weingart, Louis Boyer, and Mark Taper, purchase about 3,000 acres of farmland and begin the building of a very large, mass-produced suburban track. According to DJ... Lakewood rapidly went from a bunch of lima bean and beet fields to a grid of streets, shops, and schools. They knew they had a winning proposition when on the first day homes were open for sale. 20,000 people showed up to look at the model houses and to consider buying one. And they sold 17,500 houses within less than three years. On top of that, if you were a veteran, you could get a home loan with no down payment. World War II was literally pulling the United States out of the Depression. Now, I want to pump the brakes for a second, because let's be real. During the war in Southern California, two million people worked in the aircraft factories, and they weren't always white men. They were women. They were people of color. They built 300,000-something planes over the course of the war. However, afterwards, when, quote-unquote, the boys came home, who do you think benefited then? Here's DJ. By the time Lakewood was being developed, many of the legal strictures that prevented people of color from buying a home had fallen. But that doesn't mean that many people of color were, were excluded, because they were. Blacks were excluded. Asian Americans, to a certain extent, were excluded. Latino residents of Southern California were excluded, but maybe somewhat less. Granted, Lakewood is far more diverse today, like much of Los Angeles, but that definitely wasn't the intention at the start. If a black potential buyer came to the sales office, to a lesser extent, if a Latino or an Asian home buyer came to the uh, sales office, they were steered away from getting a discussion with a realtor. And they were sat down with a a staff member whose job it was to tell them that this community wasn't for them. Ugh. Of course, it's a story hardly exclusive to Lakewood and one that played out for decades across Southern California and the United States. But I need to tell you something important. Lakewood is not an exotic destination for me. I'm not some condescending ethnographer from out of town. I myself went to high school at Lakewood's crosstown football rival, Long Beach Polytechnic High. And in the 1970s, when I was there, Poly, located in the urban center of Long Beach, was the polar opposite of Lakewood. Extremely diverse, both racially and in terms of socioeconomic identity. It had a mix of students from established neighborhoods that had had restrictive housing covenants, as well as students from areas like the inner city that had not. 
To be sure, not everything was harmonious at Pauli in the 70s, but I can point with pride to the fact that I went to the same high school as Snoop Dogg. Anyway, despite the ugly side of its history, DJ said that Lakewood, at its essence, was built on a sense of hope, a sense of ambition, and the idea that there will always be a tomorrow, and tomorrow's going to be better than today. When Lakewood was first available to new buyers, they had been told in the marketing materials for Lakewood that the place they were coming to was the city as new as tomorrow. That was a marketing phrase that the developers used, the city as new as tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow, a better tomorrow, maybe a threatened tomorrow, but always tomorrow. And that aspect of living in Southern California from the mid-1950s onward says an awful lot about how people felt about this place, how they engaged this place, not just Lakewood, but all of Southern California, how they navigated a place that was rapidly changing in many ways, and how they were able to deal with that rapid change without fear or a loss of confidence. So tomorrow has this optimistic, confidence-building, ready-to-move-on aspect, but it does also give very little to today and often nothing for yesterday. And we don't remember much about our recent past in Southern California because we've always been focused on tomorrow. That optimism was essential for people like the Suicide Squad to devote their lives to something so difficult, so distant in the future. But it also partly explains why so much of aerospace history has neatly wiped away the Suicide Squad's contributions in lieu of, you know, that bunch of space Nazis. After the break, it's L.A., the war machine, then and now. Most people don't think of Los Angeles, historically or today, as a thriving manufacturing zone for the U.S. military. I mean, if you ask somebody in, I don't know, Des Moines or Miami, what comes to mind when they think of L.A., what's your guess? Exactly. Here's Peter Westwood. When people talk about the industry, you know, do you work in the industry? For a lot of people, most people just think that's Hollywood. But for a large part of the 20th century, the industry was really aerospace. One reason why that is not always recognized is because so much of it was conducted in secret uh, for the military. So a lot of it was kind of out of sight, out of mind. Whereas Hollywood, on the other hand, its whole business is publicity, right? <laughs> right. It's not like the Pentagon craze buzz or word of mouth, the same as, you know, James Cameron. As we've talked about in this show, the U.S. military is the unsung backer of the aerospace industry, and to some degree, that's still true today. The military is kind of the elephant in the living room of the American space program. For most of that period, the military side of the space program was maybe twice as big. The only time that the civilian side of the space program was bigger was during Apollo. But otherwise, the military space program has dwarfed the civilian side. It's uh, for military satellites, reconnaissance satellites, communications, all this stuff. JPL was essentially just one of several major war programs. For example, there was an enormous project making weapons for the Bureau of Ordnance. In this case, barrage rockets for like amphibious landing attacks, anti-attack rockets, and anti-aircraft rockets, and anti-ship rockets that are fired from airplanes. It eventually employs like 3,000 people on campus. They manufacture millions of rockets. The scale of this thing is mind-boggling. Even Caltech's historians said that for all intents and purposes, Caltech was an educational institution only in name during World War II. But the aerospace industry in Southern California didn't disappear with the end of the war. It had a big boom during the Cold War and space race, a downturn in the early 70s, another small boom in the 80s, and then a huge recession in the 90s after the Cold War ended. I remember that recession companies shutting doors, all the articles in the newspaper about engineers losing their jobs, like a huge industrial machine that had been humming for decades, essentially collapsing. 
But even during the lean years of the aerospace industry, JPL was influencing Southern California in other ways. So LA is the home of these two iconic industries. You've got Hollywood and the entertainment industry, and then you've got aircraft and aerospace. So you have these two huge industries sitting side by side in LA. One would think, was there some kind of interaction between them? Did they intersect? Where did CGI come from? Well, it involves you know high technology and computer programming, and you need big supercomputers to do it. Hollywood Studios, if you go back 50 years, didn't have any of that. They didn't have computer programmers, they didn't have supercomputers. The place that did have those things were aerospace companies. So JPL, you go back to JPL in the 1970s, they are embarking on the Voyager mission to the outer planets. And the mission designers want a way to visualize what the spacecraft is going to be doing at each planet. They go to these computer programmers to say, can you come up with these animations to help us visualize what the spacecraft is doing, what it will be seeing. One of those computer programmers was Jim Blinn. He produced animations for the Voyager mission that were shown to the public. And those computer-generated images, or CGI, caught the eyes of a few Hollywood folks. So they start coming up to JPL to get demos from Blinn for what he's doing. Next thing you know, Blinn is going to work for George Lucas on the Star Wars sequels, Star Trek, to the Wrath of Khan incorporates some of his algorithms. The founders of Pixar intersect with Jim Blinn. A lot of his algorithms, which he publishes freely, then start showing up in this software packages that are widely dispersed through the film industry. So Blinn is kind of seen as, you know, this kind of founder of CGI, but he came out of JPL. So you can thank or blame JPL in that respect for CGI. Amazing. The next time somebody makes a Jar Jar Binks joke, tell him, yes, well, blame NASA. So we've had booms and busts. We've had millions, maybe billions, spent around town on weapons of war. And now, surprise, surprise, we're booming again, though it's taken a quirky turn. What's sometimes called alternative space, new space, space 2.0 which is basically, you know, the Mojave spaceport. These people out there, Virgin Galactic and all that, trying to do privatized spaceflight. But also SpaceX. You know, SpaceX is doing pretty well for itself as one of the main now aerospace contractors. Elon Musk, who was a Silicon Valley entrepreneur from the outset, when he started an aerospace company, he didn't put it up in Silicon Valley. He put it down in Los Angeles. Um, And there's a reason for that because Los Angeles is where all of the aerospace suppliers are. Um, It's where the rest of the community is. It's also where the aerospace workforce is. You know, if you want to hire away a lot of smart aerospace engineers, they are in Los Angeles. But so SpaceX is a, maybe a symbol of the resilience of aerospace in Los Angeles and the continued presence of it. I'm optimistic about the alternative space industry. Back in 2004, I watched Virgin Galactic Spaceship One make a maiden suborbital flight from the Mojave Airport. When the space plane detached from its mother's ship and fired its rocket engine, I had chills. And not just because it was a freezing cold morning in the high desert. Three years later, I interviewed Elon Musk and the SpaceX team for a profile in Los Angeles Magazine. This was back when Elon answered his own email, and the company was in what looked like a glorified garage in El Segundo, California. Of course, today, Virgin Galactic is offering real suborbital flights to paying tourists, and SpaceX is ferrying astronauts to the International Space Station. In the 1990s, private space advocates used to say, quote, space is a place, not a program, and people laughed just like people once laughed at the Suicide Squad. They're not laughing now. I'm M.G. Lord, and this is L.A. Made, Blood, Sweat, and Rockets. L.A. Made, Blood, Sweat, and Rockets is hosted by me, M.G. Lord. The show is a production of Alea Studios in collaboration with Western Sound. 
Shana Naomi Crockmull is our vice president of podcasts, and Antonia Sarahito is the executive producer for Alea Studios. Ben Adair is the executive producer for Western Sound. Dan Leone is the showrunner. Producers are Savannah Wright, Tyler Hill, Caitlin Parker, and Becky Nicolaitis. The show is written by Rachel Knowles, Rose Kranz Baldwin, and me, M.G. Lord. It was edited by Savannah Wright. Sound design by Tyler Hill. Mixing and mastering by Tom McLean. Research and consulting by History Studio. Our website at alaus.com is designed by Andy Cheatwood and the digital marketing teams at Alaus Studios. The marketing team of Alaus Studios created our branding. Thanks to the team at Alea Studios, including Taylor Kaufman, Sabir Brara, Kristen Hayford, Kristen Muller, Andy Orozco, Michael Cosentino, and Leo G. LA Made, Blood, Sweat, and Rockets is a production of Alea Studios. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.